Hello and welcome back to the channel. So, welcome to the second session of this course, Automation and Robotics. And today we will talk about industrial robots. Um, obviously, this course focuses entirely on industrial robots. So that's why we will, uh, the primary focus of our theoretical foundation or background is on industrial robots. So what is the topic for today? So the, the basically what we're going to talk about today is uh, we're going to talk about components of industrial robots, but very briefly because we're going to come back to this topic, which is the, the components, in a later session, in a later uh, video. But for now, we will very briefly introduce these concepts, but then in the future, we will come back for them later. Uh, the next topic will be... Uh, Terminologies, important terminologies and definitions uh, in industrial robots, although they are applying to manipulators in general, but then we will talk about them. I mean, in this course, when we mention industrial robots, we generally mean uh, manipulators, even though that mobile robots could be used in an industrial application, but we are not talking about uh, those for now. So, because 99% of industrial robots are manipulators, so that is why we would focus on uh, when we mention when we say industrial robots, we really mean manipulators. Uh, if you have watched the previous video, then you know what is a manipulator and what is an industrial robot uh, and what is a mobile robot. But uh, never, don't worry about it. The, the concept of the manipulator will also be discussed in detail uh, in this session as well as the next video as well. Next, we want to talk about applications and general uses of industrial robots in manufacturing. And then finally, uh, working with industrial robots and how do we actually make the robot do the tasks that we want. And finally, some online resources that can be useful for you in this course in robotics in general, and to you in general working on your applications. So let's take a look at the course. So the first part is uh, components of industrial robots. Now, of course, the very first component is the controller. There are generally uh, several, many types of controllers out there, and uh, the controllers could be uh, off-the-shelf open-source controllers such as the Raspberry Pi or Arduino or BeagleBone or similar, or it could be a proprietary controller, uh, essentially uh, created by the company specifically for their robot. If you are buying a, a black box robot, a uh, black box means um, it, it contains a proprietary technology. The controller inside might be an open source, might be their own developed uh, controller. Uh, but nevertheless, regardless of the type of the controller, the controllers simply do the same job uh, in any machine. Essentially, the controllers are in any electromechanical system, whether it's a robot or not. They are essentially the brain. They receive the input information, be it from sensor data or from user definition or user input. And then based on the information and based on preset parameters, aka the program, they can then move the actuators and, um, and elements of the machine and, their, and in, other word, in, in our world here today, the robot uh, accordingly. So based on the information coming in and based on predefined settings, they they give the commands or give the output to the joints to move and motions and so on and so forth. The controllers could be open source. Uh, open source means they are available out there. You can just uh, buy it and then plug in your own applications. Or it could be uh, proprietary or you know owned by the, the company. And they're not allowed to be shared or worked with. Uh, by the way, this proprietary one has an Arduino in it. This is a nano Arduino right there. It looks like they're using the Arduino or the nano Arduino, and then they're adding their own uh, flavor into it. Anyway, now the next part of the, con I mean, obviously the controllers will move something. So that something is usually the actuators. This could be simply motors or, you know, or linear actuators or, or any other kind of motion actuators. And actuators are not necessarily electrical actuators. They could be hydraulic actuators. They could be, you know, mechanical. They could be any kind of way as long as the job is the same, is to provide the action or the motion. Uh, actuate simply means make the action happen. So if you have a linear actuator, it simply means move the object in a linear matter or manner. If it's an angular actuator or motor, then rotate the object and so on. Every joint of the robot will have an actuator on it, you know, a motor or a, 
If it's a linear joint, it would have a linear actuator, and so on and so forth. The next obvious item is sensors. Now, sensors are the devices that gather information, gather data. Whether it's a temperature sensor, a proximity sensor, or any kind of sensor, there are plenty of types and, um, and you know, of sensors. And these sensors, um, they are also classified into many ways, based on capacity, first of all, based on the type of data they, they capture, based on their range, capacity, um, uh, the type of output they produce, whether it's digital or analog, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The field of sensors is a it's a field on its own. However, um, uh, I'm not going to delve into it. I provided some notes, and if you want to go into details about sensors, because um, I assume at this point that you are familiar with sensors. But if not, there is a, a separate document called uh, Sensors available or for you to to refresh your memory on sensors. Now. Um, Controllers, actuators, and sensors. Put it all together and you get manipulators. A manipulator essentially it's an electromechanical system consisting of a controller, a number of actuators, and optionally sensors. A majority of the actua uh, manipulators may not have sensors. They will only have controller and actuator. And of course the links as you can see here. So what is the purpose of the manipulator? Uh, as the name implies, manipulator simply means it's a device that manipulates the, or sets the position and orientation of the end of the robot. Like whatever we put at the end of it, like a gripper or a tool, the position and orientation of it is manipulated or defined by the manipulator. Think of the manipulator as your arm. And think of the end effect as your, your wrist and your fingers. If you would like to position your fingers, you, then the rest of your arm would move it. If you would like to change the orientation of your wrist, then also your arm will do it. So think of your arm as the manipulator and think of your wrist as the end effector, which is actually the next item of the industrial robot. As the name, again, as the name implies, the end effector is the device that is put at the end of the robot and that is provides the effect that we want. So that is why the name end effector. It's at the end of the robot and provides the effect that we want. So what is the effect that we want? Well, what do you want the robot to do? Do you want the robot to, to, to be a pick and place robot? So in this case, you will need a gripper because a gripper will then capture something and then put it um, somewhere, you know, capture and then release it. If you want a welding robot, then you'll need a welding gun in the end. If you want um, a laser, uh, an inspection robot, then you need an inspection sensor. And if you want a spray paint, uh, then you need a spray paint nozzle in the end. So whatever effect that you need the robot to do, it's defined usually by the end effector. And therefore, the position and orientation of the end effector, once again, is defined or set by the manipulator. So, in other words, the industrial robot really is a combination of a manipulator plus the end effector. For example, a welding robot will have um, the manipulator plus the welding gun. A spray paint robot will have the manipulator plus the spray paint nozzle in the end, and so on and so forth. Uh, we will come back again in greater details to talk about manipulators and end effectors. Um, so why did we talk about controllers and actuators and sensors? Now, if you would like to work with a pre-made or a standard manipulator, then there are we will actually see those again in the in the next session, in the next video. But if you would like to build your own custom manipulator, your own custom system, then you'll have to build it from scratch using controller plus actuators plus some sensors if you want to make it a smart manipulator. But if you want to make it a classic manipulator, then all you need is a controller and actuators, and of course, links. Uh, if you want to make your own custom manipulator, or if you want to build a manipulator from scratch. But if you want to use a ready-made manipulator, or you work with an existing manipulator, like it's already built in, in your house or in your workshop, then um, you can go ahead and work with it. You don't have to build it from scratch. Okay, so now that we talked about the components, Let's introduce a number of terminologies and definitions that are used in industrial robotics. These terminologies are used throughout the course and um, 
it's important that you understand what do they mean uh, for you to know the so how to implement or apply the, the, the analysis later on. The analytic analysis that we're going to do later on, such as kinematics, et cetera, will use these terminologies on a regular basis. So it's important for you to have that understanding and, and knowledge uh, uh, for now. So, uh, so let's talk about the, the first concept. And the first and most important concept of industrial robotics is the concept of the degree of freedom, or DOF. DOF, or the degrees of freedom, is essentially the number of free and independent motions that the robot can perform. Um, it's possible for a joint to have multiple DOFs. And that's why uh, the number of degrees of freedom is not necessarily the number of joints. Uh, for example, um, your wrist, your human wrist, can it's just one joint, which is the wrist, but it can perform three different motions. Is that shown next? Yes, it's shown next. So essentially, let's take a look at this manipulator first. It can perform three independent motions. One here, uh, first of all, one at the base, which is right here. It can rotate about itself. And one at the shoulder and one at the elbow. So these three independent motions, and that's why this particular manipulator has three degrees of freedom. This one, on the other hand, has one, two, three, four, and five. So that's why we, we call this uh, manipulator or this system five degree of freedom system. This, on the other hand, has more. We have one, two, three, four, five, and six. So this has six degrees of freedom. Actually, this one is a manipulator plus N defector, and this one too. This is a manipulator, three degrees of freedom manipulator plus another three degrees of freedom from, for the N defector. Now, a better understanding of the concept of the free degree, I mean, the, the degrees of freedom is in your own hand. Here's your wrist right now, and you can actually perform these motions yourself. Although it's one joint, but it can do three motions. By moving your palm up and down, that's the pitch, and that's one motion. By going sideways, that's the yaw motion. And by rolling your, your wrist, that's essentially the roll. So three different joints, uh, excuse me, Three different motions, but one joint. And that is why your wrist joint has three degrees of freedom. And this is shown here, by the way. Every motion is about one axis. So this is about the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. The z is axis is pointing, it's coming out of the, of the sheet as we look from the top. OK, another example of roll pitch Xiao is very commonly used in the aviation industry. When the plane rolls, it rolls around its own about its axis. When it yaws, it goes sideways, and when it pitches, it goes, the nose of the plane goes up and down, and so on. Now, in our human hand, I, we said only that in your wrist alone, you have three degrees of freedom. What about your fingers? Uh, you see, initially in the past, I thought that in the past that every finger has three degrees of freedom. And I was wrong, because I studied some more, and I found out that actually it's a lot more than that. In the thumb, there are four degrees of freedom because one, two, and then two here, that's four. And then in every one of the rest of the fingers, you have actually um, four each, uh, five each, excuse me, five each. So five multiplied by four, that's already um, 20, plus four here, that's 24. And I didn't count the, one, the three more for the rest, so I could have come here and put seven. But that's excluding the wrist. So 24 excluding the wrist. So just for, maybe I should modify this. Let's do it now. So go back here. Yeah, this should be 27. Because it includes the, the wrist as well. So 27 degrees of freedom from the wrist, I mean, for the wrist and your fingers. So just amazing. And that's just one hand. And and the other hand will be another 27. And if you add the, the, the rest of your arm, like your elbow and your shoulder, that's even more. So it's amazing how complicated our human body is. So you see, the, the higher the, the degrees of freedom, the more complex the motion of the robot can be done. That's why our human hand can do magical things. It could be a painter, it could be a surgeon, it could be a boxer. So that's uh, basically all has to do with the complexity of the design of our hands. Let's move on to more terminologies. Now that we talked about degrees of freedom, the second most important concept in industrial robots is the coordinates, 
or the robot coordinates. Generally speaking, and and this the concept of um, uh, the concept of robot coordinates is vital for uh, later on when we work on kinematics. Uh, that is why it's important that you understand the concept of global as well as local coordinates. So let's go ahead. So global coordinates describe the coordinates that are at the base of the robot, the very center of the robot. And everything else, I mean, all the motions of the robot, the location of the joints and all of that stuff will be referenced to this coordinate. So this will be the 0, 0, 0 point. And this point, for example, will be 0, 0 and then 10, because 0, x and y, and then z will be something like 10, 10 cm, for example, something like that. So this coordinate has several names. We can call it global, home coordinates, fixed, because they're not going anywhere, it's fixed. And sometimes we also call it the base coordinates, because they're here. And also we call it the x, y, z, capital X, capital Y, and capital Z, or even small letters, but as long as we're using them, I mean, x, y, z. So what is the meaning? What is the significance? We will see that when we talk about kinematics. And let's just say a few sessions down the road. Now let's move on to talk about the next coordinate, which is the local coordinates. Um, sometimes also called hand coordinates. It was discovered at some point that when you are already here at the point of the robot and you want to approach something, you don't think about the base anymore. You think about your hand. Imagine your hand right now, and you're trying to grab something in front of your hand, let's say a cup of coffee or, or a pen from the table. You don't think about your feet, or you don't think about your seat. You think about the distance between your arm and the object. And that's exactly is the distance that is right here. So if there's an object, uh, let me um, go back to the highlight here. Let's imagine there is something right here, and this manipulator wants to grab it. It will, when we think about that, we will honestly, I mean, we will naturally think about covering this distance. You know what I mean? And that's why this coordinate right here is more important than the global coordinates just now. And if I want to twist or turn or whatever, then I will also be moving around the other two coordinates. So then this is the concept of the hand or the end effector coordinates. Uh, other names is the local coordinates because the reason why we use the word local because not only that we're going to have a coordinate here, we're also going to have a coordinate at this joint, at this joint, and every one of these joints, we will have a coordinate. So whatever you, are, wherever, when you are here, for example, there will be the local coordinates here, and when you are at this joint, it will be a local coordinates here, and so on. And another name for it is the tool coordinates, the end effector, hand, the moving coordinates because. As you can see, as the robot moves or changes orientation, the coordinate or this frame right here will move with it. Unlike the, the base uh, coordinates. See, the base coordinate, no matter what's going on with the robot, moving, twisting, whatever, right, this point right here or this frame will never move. That's why it's called fixed. But when this uh, hand of the robot moves around, the, the, this coordinate will move with it. And that's why we call this the, the moving coordinates. Or sometimes we simply call, we use NOA. Rather than XYZ, we simply use NOA. N for normal, A for approach. When you want to grab that coffee or pen, you will approach it. And of course, O for orientation. So NOA is the term where N replacing X, O replacing uh, Y, and A replacing Z. Sometimes we also use X and Y and Z, but we, we use a, a qualifying term. Like we call it the local X or the moving X or, you know, the end X, something like that. We don't just simply say X because if we just say X, Y, Z, then we mean the global. But if we qualify it with something else like the local or the moving X axis or something like that or the local X axis, then now we are talking about the local. No longer we are talking about the global. I understand that this concept might be a little bit confusing, but don't worry. Uh, later on when we do kinematics, uh, it will make sense. Let's move on. Now, these two quick concepts will be quite simple and straightforward to, to understand. Um, right now, if you stretch your arm and you make a little bit of twist motion, you realize that there's a, a limit to what your arm can reach. Um, the same thing if you move your arms about your head, like create a dome above your head right now. Well, this area or this space of volume is called the work envelope. 
or the robot and the robot. It's the size limit of the robot to what it can do. And this size or this space is very important when you're talking about things like um, floor management or allocating space for this robot, you don't want to place another machine within this work envelope or another station or another human for that matter, right? Because there might be a risk of that machine hitting this robot or injuring the human. And that's why you would allocate this space with some safety so that the robot cannot be disturbed, cannot hurt anyone and cannot damage another machine. The payload, however, is, I mean, on the other hand, is something easier. It's essentially the amount of weight that the robot can carry, including its own weight. So if you apply it or if you provide it with a weight that is heavier than the payload, the, the robot will not move. It might even get damaged. So let's now talk about another concept. And this is also important when it comes to robot, I mean, industrial robots or manipulators. And when you actually write a program to tell the robot, go to location A, for example, you would expect the robot to go to that location. That's the point. If it doesn't go there, then we have a problem. So let's imagine a situation where we want the robot to start from here, for example, and go to this point right here. But we notice that the robot doesn't always get there. In fact, never gets there. It always gets somewhere nearby. But the error or the difference between the point and location is more or less constant. So in this case, in this situation, we call the, this robot accurate, but not precise. Accurate in the sense that it knows where the location is. I mean, it goes to the right target, but there is a small or there is a significant error that is preventing it from getting there. We might need to do some, um, um, some adjustment or some calibration to, to make it uh, reach the right target. On the other hand, this is the second situation, starting from here again, and instead of going to this point, it goes here. And as you can see, the difference between here, this point, and here is that it's more or less the same location. There is no error this time. But this is the wrong location. You know I mean? And in this situation, we can say that the robot is precise in a sense that there is no error. You see, it's almost there. But it's not accurate because it goes to the wrong place altogether. So it goes to the wrong place. No error, yes, no calibration needed, but it goes to the wrong place altogether. So we can say that it's precise but not accurate. Of course, what we want in the end is the robot to be accurate and precise is what is happening here. Essentially, the robot knows the right location and also there is minimal or almost no error. So that's exactly our target, is to achieve that the robot is accurate and precise. Okay, the next um, requirement, and actually one of the greatest purposes of robots, is exactly these two features, which is reliability and repeatability. So what is the difference between them? And reliability essentially is that you are relying on the robot to perform the job every time you need it. So if I say to the robot, uh, weld, it will weld. If I say grab or pick and place, it will do it. And you expect it to do it successfully every time. So every time means what? Every time I press the button, it will do the job. Every time. So if let's say if I press the button 10 times, it will perform the task 10 times. Maybe 9 times, and it's fine, 90% success, and so on and so forth. The repeatability, on the other hand, is... Uh, if you press the button, it will do the job a hundred times. So what does that mean? See, we humans, we could be reliable. I mean, I can tell you, I can, play, I can pick my pen and I can move it from A to B. And I can guarantee you that every human in the world can do this task. So we are all reliable here. We can pick the pen, we can put it from point A to point B. But can you do this task 100 times in a row? You can say, yes, I can, but go ahead and try. Maybe about 10 times later, eventually your arms start to become pain, in pain, and eventually you will not reach even 20 or maybe 50. By then, your arm will start to strain, your muscles will start to develop pain, and then you will have to stop. So you do not, you may have reliability, but you do not have repeatability. A simple example of that is climbing the stairs. I'm sure you can climb one step. I'm sure that everyone in the world, every adult or even a child, can climb one step on the stairs. 
but tell the same person to repeat the same jump, you know, climbing the steps, but a hundred times, a hundred steps. Good luck with that. A hundred steps, you can say roughly every level in the building, that's roughly 10 to 12 steps. Let's just say 10, okay, just to make the counting easy. So if it's 10 steps, that means you have to, if you want to climb 100 steps, that's 10 levels, 10 floors. Can, can you walk 10 floors up without uh, suffering? Some people who are athletic enough, they can do it. They can even run the steps. But on average, most people will, by the time they reach level three, 3 or 2, they will start to lose their consciousness. They start to grasp for breath and they will, and their legs will be in pain and they have to stop. And that is one example of repeatability. Reliability, yes, you can do it, but repeatability means you need to do it repeatedly. Okay, so these are the concepts that we will use later on. Uh, let's just quickly recap them. Uh, degrees of freedom, which is a measure of how many uh, motions the robot can do. It's also a measure of complexity of the robot. Quite a rule to say is that the higher the degrees of freedom, the complex the robot can do, and the complex motion the robot can do, and also the complex analysis and, and uh, control it requires. Uh, global, uh, global axis, uh, local axis, um, work envelope and robot payload, and the concepts of accuracy versus precision, as well as reliability versus repeatability. Now let's talk about applications of industrial robots. You see them in the movies a lot, moving about and doing some sparkles here and there. But then what exactly are they doing in the factories? So let's take a look at those applications. Uh, the very first and foremost application of metal process is metal processing. Metal processing in manufacturing terms is the general term describing manufacturing operations such as machining, uh, joining, and there is actually other stuff like, like um, um, uh, when you change the shape of the object like uh, extrusion or or you know or, or milling or other operations. But for robotics terms, for robotics operation, the most two popular operations is welding or joining, as you can see here, and the second one is machining. And uh, the number one application of industrial robots of any kind is robotic welding. Robotic welders, and there are several types of robotic welders, but for now, most of them are essentially, uh, this is the number one application, robotic welders used in industrial application. The second application by far yeah, is machining. This is where you have um, CNC machining. I mean, CNC machines are not necessarily robots, but sometimes uh, to make the cutting very flexible or very complex, it can be given to a six degrees of freedom robot. The term between CNC machine center and um, machine robot or you know machining robot is quite a gray area. Because you could have a, a turning machine, and you could have a milling machine, you could have a drilling machine, all CNC. But then, if you have a you know a machining robot, it it simply can do all of these tasks with the exception of turning. Maybe it can do drilling and and uh, and, uh, and milling with great ease. But uh, turning, uh, it's a machine on its own. Uh, apart from metal material processing, what's next? Well, the next pre uh, operation is surface treatment. Okay, you have manufactured the part, but we need to do some some more treatment. Uh, this includes um, finishing, like grinding, polishing, coating, spraying the material, like spray painting. I mean, the spray painting could be a paint or it could be a coating, or it could be many other things. It could be really printing on a piece of paper, etc., etc. So these are all examples of um, industrial robots that are involved in surface treatments. Handling robots is also or uh, are also a huge class of industrial robots, uh, pick and place robots, sorting, uh, uh, resizing, reorienting, loading, unloading robots. These are all examples of uh, uh, handling robots. The next type of robot is assembly robots, and these are uh, these are the ones you probably have seen in the movies. You have a, a you can have a production line of cars, and the cars are or maybe robots, and then they are moving on a conveyor belt, and then a group of robots come in, and then they all uh, start welding at the same time. And these are actually not science fiction; they are real. And uh, these are assembly bots or assembly robots. They usually work in teams, and it's in very rapid motion, 
and when the product is in place then they all jump into their location and perform their joining operations and they are used heavily in the automotive industry inspection robots are robots that as the name implies perform inspection operation they check for errors they check for problems that may or may not be difficult to see in the, in the naked eye or maybe if you it will take a longer time for humans to spot uh, the robot can scan quickly and can process the visual information or the infrared or information a lot more quickly and therefore the inspection process can be done a lot more faster so these are a summary of those applications material processing welding machining and surface treatment handling robots as an assembly or assembly robots so Okay, what's the next step? The next topic is working with industrial robots. Okay, now that you have the robot, how can we make it do our task? There are several algorithms or methods of controlling robots. The first one, or the classical one, was what is called fixed algorithm. Um, and fixed, in a sense, is that is, let's call it this robot the conventional robot, or the not smart robot. <coughs> Excuse me. What does that mean essentially is once you pre-program the robot and it's doing its job in um, if something has happened, let's say if the item is not in the right place or if you put your hand in front of it, it will ignore you and it will continue to do its job. And that's why it's called fixed. It's not responsive to the environment. And this is what we call or the classic robot. This is the thing that happened in the 50s and the 60s. Um, essentially, the robot will perform a very repetitive, very high volume job, but uh, yeah, it's very high volume and very repetitive task. It's very, very ideal for fixed automation. Remember that? And it's required a very simple step, but uh, it's that simple step, like pick and place, has to be repeated uh, over a thousand times, something like that. Like uh, climbing the steps is also a simple step. Just move your leg, one leg up, and move the other leg up, and that's it. Okay, so now the next, so that was the first uh, paradigm of control, which is the fixed programs. The next was the shift to CNC controlled robot. I mean, the term CNC controlled is sort of a kind of a not a good term, or I don't know, an accurate term, because the word C in, in the letter C in CNC is controlled. But anyway, um, the reason why I use this term to describe the kind of programming that this robot, this kind of robot can do. It's a complex program that um, can perform any kind of shape or any kind of complex operation. It's usually for complex robots, but it's also very time consuming. The parts that you see in front of you might take a long time to perform. And as we discussed in the previous session, this kind of operation may cause uh, a bottleneck uh, because of the time delay to produce these kind of uh, shapes. That is why these kind of steps are may or may not be, uh, may not be a high volume operation. <coughs> Now, smart industrial robot is a semi or a subsection from smart robots in general. And these smart robots are just like any other industrial robots, but they are actually uh, equipped with data gathering devices and otherwise known as sensors. And with the presence of sensors on board and with the ability to process the information from these sensors, these robots uh, and I mean, the possibilities becomes much, much greater. The robot could become responsive if there is an obstacle. Maybe if you put your hand in the path of the robot, it will avoid your hand or stop altogether. Or based on the type of object that is incoming, it will perform the, the required task. For example, if you provide a blue item, it will perform program number one. But if you provide a red item or a red part, it will perform program number two. So it's, in that sense, more responsive, more flexible, uh, and more um, environment responsive robots. Now, we keep going with this. Now, uh, the next step in algorithms is the advanced algorithms. Something that is a science on its own, like AI algorithm, machine learning, fuzzy logic, and more. And in these advanced applications, the robot itself learns from experience, for example. After producing 100 units and noticing that, that uh, for example, yeah, this is an example scenario where uh, AI or machine learning can, can really be useful. 
after say 100 units of, of our 100 cuts or 100 operations of cutting the machine recognized that the error is building up is sort of accumulating so based on not based on one part but based on all of the 100 area uh, previous parts so based on that it can recognize that there is a situation going on and then it adjusts its own program it adjusts its own parameters to counter the effect of this accumulating error and then result in a more accurate production. Uh, so that's another example of advanced algorithms that can be done in conjunction when, with smart robotics. Now, the next phase to this is cloud robotics. Now, um, whatever uh, type of robot that we discussed so far, whether it's a fixed program, uh, CNC, a smart robot, or even advanced algorithm, there is one thing in common, and that is, again, data. Um, in order to perform its task, whether it's an industry or, by the way, this, the, this, this slide right here, it's about robots in general, not necessarily industrial. It could be any robot you see in front of you. That's why, as you can see in the picture, we have industrial robots, humanoids, mobile robots, even driverless cars, drones, social robots, medical robots, even a cooking robot, and... Uh, servers i think again so yeah so this is industrial social robots mobile robot and driverless car drone um, a social robot again that is doing uh, interaction with human medical robot cooking robot and i don't know what this building is doing it's probably a server yeah i think this is the server so what's going on is that for all of these robots to perform their job there is a heavy burden of computational operations they have to perform they have to you see, when you think about it, it's, um, when we think about sensor, let's, think, let's just think about one sensor right now. You have one sensor and you're receiving uh, 10 different pieces of information. In order for you to understand what's going on, you have to read every one of these values and then you have to process it. What do you mean by process it? You have to check every value. And then for every value, you have to check, is this value bigger than the limit or smaller than the limit? You have to run an F statement, basically, 10 times on only 10 units of value. Now imagine if your sensor can give you not one unit of data, but 1,000 units. So you have to run edge statement 1,000 times. What if you have 10 sensors? So 10 multiplied by 1,000, 10,000 edge statements. What if you have 100 sensors? You get the idea. So in most of these robots, they will have to perform a considerable amount of computational operations. This includes sensor data processing, uh, localization and mapping for for mobile robots, actuations for other robots like moving this joint and responding to user input and interface and all that stuff. So you have a, a huge and heavy computational burden that is applied on the robot. And it often requires a very powerful and big computers, onboard computers, to perform this task. I mean, think about it this way. In order to you, for you to, to run a graphical application, let's say gaming, right, you need a powerful laptop uh, capable of, really, uh, of having a, a GPU as well as a, a video card and so on and so forth, right? So if you do not have a powerful laptop or a powerful machine, you cannot run this game properly, or at least you cannot run it to the right specs. So the same thing happens in robots. The robots themselves, in order for them to perform their operations, they will need to have a very powerful computational powers. However, this requires them to have very powerful computers, uh, which means imagine this guy right here, it will need to have a, almost a desktop or a, a big CPU on board to perform its calculations. The same thing for this guy, the same thing for this dude over here. And the same thing for this guy. Remember, you see the drone here, it has, have you ever seen a drone carrying a, a, C, a CPU? Of course not. So, uh, that's why um, this is the concept of cloud robotics. You see, instead of doing the computations by itself, instead of the robot doing the calculations on, on, uh, on itself, it will then connect to the cloud and then tap into the resources of the cloud. What does that mean? Well, it will broadcast the information, the raw data from the sensors, 
and all of the processing and all of the you know logical testing and all of that stuff will be performed in supercomputers on, in servers online and then the results and the output will come down to the robot from the cloud so all the computational or the, all the heavy burden from the i mean the heavy computational burden will be conducted in servers online but the robot itself will only have raw data and then um, operations. What I mean means simply, I capture raw data broadcast to the cloud. The data is processed, and then commands and you know suggestions or recommendations are brought down from the cloud. And then I can then use that recommendations to perform my job. So, and of course, this concept um, in the past was not possible, but with the development of uh, internet and very powerful internet speeds very heavy uh, wavelength of internet power, internet connections and capabilities uh, this became a reality and it does exist today so when you add that or when you link that to industrial cloud robotics it becomes even more powerful in industrial robots this can be even greater robots can be linked directly to the factory's master plan if you have studied production planning and control then you will know what the master plan is um, think of it like the overall plan for the factory. How much production we need, which machines we're going to use, uh, who's going to, what resources we're going to use, uh, what's the plan for the next three months, and so on and so forth. Uh, maintenance records, production plans. This whole thing is done in one record or one plan. It's called the master plan. Now imagine, of course, for this plan to work effectively, again, the manufacturer, I mean, the, the managers and the and the production heads, they will need information. And where does the information come from? From the robots directly. So the robot can be linked to the each other. And, uh, and then by linking the robot to the system, then the information that the manager requires will be readily available. Uh, in the past, before this, this information used to be calculated, collected by hand. You will really need to send workers who will have to monitor the operations and really take notes and record manually or using a computer, you have to key in the values directly, like data entry. And then this information will be brought. Imagine you have to hire someone just to watch your operations and record it, or you have to do it yourself. If you have one machine, it's fine, but if you have 100 different machines, you need 100 different people. If you have more, then you get the idea. So imagine if you don't have to send anyone to record anything. Imagine if the machine itself can give you the information directly. And this is where cloud or industrial cloud robotics become more powerful. At the same time, since the robots are connected to the same network, they are also connected to each other. So now you have what is called robot-to-robot -robot interaction. And this allows coordinated operations and programming. Remember those assembly robots that we saw a few slides ago? Those assembly robots, the way they work together, it's not blindly, it's not fixed programming the way uh, this kind of uh, robot, uh, let's go back here. Uh, no. Um, and uh, in an earlier slide, we saw something called fixed automation. Like you take a program and then you pre-program the motion of the robot and then it will perform blindly. Well, these are not that. Yes, they have a series of tests or th series of locations or spots to do, but they are also aware of each other, aware of each other's positions. So to avoid collisions, to avoid problems, and also to coordinate their tasks. In other words, make sure that everyone is performing their task uh, at the same time or uh, completed accordingly and not individually or blind, uh, uh, blindly from each other. So that's, again, uh, another example of this is that if you have stations. So this machine will not operate unless this one finished already or unless the batch is ready and so on and so forth. So again, connecting to the network, or the local network at least, will allow coordinated operations and coordinated programming. Instead of writing a program for each task or for each robot, you will write one program, but then you can have individual parts for each robot. This can again can happen if you have a network of robots connected together. Remember the real name CNC, com computer network, is really mean, the real meaning of it is that if you have multiple computers networked together, each controlling a robot. So that's how this thing works. Now, if you're already here, and if you already have data in your own company server, or if you already have it online, or like in your own cloud, or your own private sense, uh, server, or in a public server, then it's just a matter of using connecting it to your people, 
or to other people or other industries, and voila, you have Industrial Revolution 4 or Industry 4.0. The concept of IR4 actually was born from this. Well, essentially, is okay, we already have the technology in place, we just have to link it to the cloud. And this is where IoT or IR4 came from. The, the information is readily available. All you have to do is package it and put it in an IoT client and we're good to go. We'll, we will see this in a minute. And I think this is the last part. Uh, yeah, the last part we're gonna see now, which is that's how uh, once the technology was in place, then the, the once the, all of this technology was already in place, then the robot can be linked to online platforms and be ready for industrial revolutions. Uh, for. Uh, examples of these online platforms, industrial IoT as well as industrial ROS. Um, we might be familiar with IoT uh, from the from the very first slide. If not, we'll, we'll go back and watch it. Or if you if you want, uh, basically IoT I think is discussed in the next couple of slides. So let's talk about online resources. The first example is IoT robotics. Now the controller of robotics. Uh, or any other automated system can be a network ready controller. We, we talked about this. Uh, when we, in, the, in the earlier session, when we talked about components of industrial robots, we said that the controller could be a network ready controller. And if it's network ready controller, then it's already ready to, to work with the IoT. You see examples of network ready controllers like Arduino, Node MCO, Raspberry Pi, BeagleBone, or others. Uh, Okay, so the network credit controller can be programmed with the IoT protocols. Like if you just bring in the library and you link it with a with a with the data packaging protocols, then you are ready to work with IoT. All you need to know is how to connect to the cloud and, and also how to package the information in the right way, and then you are good to go. So here's a, an example of this. Rather than having a sensor or a thing, we have a robot. And the robot will actually already have its own information, like you know, joint motion, uh, sensors if it has built on board sensors, user commands if, uh, if it has received any, and all of that information can then be packaged into uh, IoT ready packaging methods, MQTT or or JSON or any other methods. And this information will then be broadcast to the cloud, uh, and then once there, then it can be processed and they can then be sent to IoT clients for monitoring, and remote monitoring, and remote evaluation. A great example of this is the FarmBot or FarmDotBot. And I suggest strongly that you go and check it out by clicking on this link. Um, it's essentially, it's an IoT-based or an open source IoT robot. I, I may, they may not call it IoT robot, but I will call it anyway, uh, because it utilizes a Raspberry Pi uh, controller plus another online, another um, network ready controller. It broadcasts information to the cloud and you can actually access the information in real time using uh, their app, or you can use it from the web as well. So that's the very definition of IoT uh, robotics in play. Um, IoT robotics can work in a sense, it can provide a great platform to implement cloud robotics. One of the biggest problems with cloud robotics is how you physically link the robot to the cloud. In the past, this used to be done through um, a different kind of organization, but IoT does that easily because the focus here is on the data itself and not on the robot. Doesn't matter what the robot is doing as long as it can broadcast information. Once the information is broadcast, then from then on, it's just like any other information on the internet. And it can then can be used, uh, can be processed, and so on and so forth. In cloud robotics, I think we just talked about it, but it doesn't matter, we can, we can repeat. In cloud robotics, computational heavy operations, such as sensors, library management, data storage, are performed in super heavy computers uh, online. And relieving the robots from having to perform these operations, which allows for less, com or less than complex onboard computers, which allows for embedded systems. You see, embedded systems are very simple and very small computers. I mean, small in size, like the Raspberry Pi and the Arduino are basically credit card size computers or controllers. But that small size system is very limited in capabilities. So on its own, it cannot perform heavy computational um, burdens. But with cloud robotics, it can, by simply broadcasting the information to the cloud, then the information is processed there, and then the results coming back to them, to the robot. 
Of course, this requires also a very reliable and very fast connection to, for this operation to happen. Embedded systems uh, such as computer on chip, control on chip systems such as Raspberry Pi, Arduino, and NodeMCU are already network ready and they allow this operation. Another example of uh, application of IoT robotics is group robotics, which we also talked about earlier a while ago, which allows robots to collaborate while performing the same task. Uh, in IoT, we call this thing to thing IoT. And information can be exchanged between the individual devices, which allows them to perform their collective task better. Now, this was mentioned earlier, the robot operating system. Um, although the word operating system makes it feel like it's an operating system like Windows or Mac, it is not really an operating system. Think of it like a collection of applications that allows you to work with the hardware that is called a, a robot. You turn it into a, like, it allows you to transfer with it, or, you know, think of it like a, it, it turns like a, the physical machine into a, a device that you can interact with it, or interface with it. So uh, it's an open source platform for developing high-end robot software. High-end doesn't mean uh, expensive. It simply means, um, I'll show you what high-end in, in a minute. Now, the Rust community includes researchers and developers, and industry, by the way, from all around the world, developing standardized solutions from open source for open source robot system. Open source means that anyone has the access to these applications. What does that mean? Uh, it has an extensive library of robot software and solutions. Um, if you want, a, okay, you want a library for image processing, it's available. You want a library for navigation, it's available. You want a library for robot manipulator, it's available. You want a library for pick and place, it's available. It basically, available means is that you can go and read the code yourself, you can tinker with it, you can copy it, and then make your own version. Uh, and of course, you can then contribute to the society by adding your own contribution to the, to the platform. All of that is possible. Community development and peer evaluation. If you have contributed with your code, if the community can then take a look at your code and, and evaluate and give you some feedback and so on and so forth. And if it's good, and if it's really good, it can then can be added to the core uh, features of the library, uh, of the ROS uh, library. It's very it's expanded very, very rapidly, uh, the, the, the ROS community, and extensive hardware support. Uh, in, in other words, if you buy an off-the-shelf robot, the chances are every manufacturer in the world already supports ROS. So you don't have to do really a lot of hardware uh, tinkering unless you want to build a custom robot on your own. It's compatible with any other open source platform, meaning uh, there are plenty of other open, open source platforms such as, for example, Android um, uh, mapping uh, libraries, um, visual, robot visualization libraries. They can also work in collaboration with ROS. And plenty of uh, standardized robot software is reusable, extendable, customizable, and open source. So what is high-end programming. So let's think of this diagram for a second and imagine that we are working with a complex robot. Now the way that the robot software works is actually based on layers. At the very beginning, the bottom layer right here, you have what is called the mechanical and physical design of the system. Then you have what is called controller architecture, like you have sensors, actuators, and linking to them. Then you have the basic motion and locomotion uh, uh, programs like how do you turn a joint how do you move forward how do you turn right how do you turn left then you have advanced programs such as trajectory planning or motion based motion planning sensor data processing these are advanced concepts because you, processing is can do a lot like figuring out a limit or you know and so on uh, behavioral robotics mapping obstacle avoidance path selection probabilistic filters navigation, human-robot interaction. These are all advanced concepts. But then all of these are generic. Like, if you, what, are, what do you mean by generic? You see, uh, when, when I want to build, or when I want, um, uh, okay, for example, I give an example of a higher-end program. I want a delivery robot. Um, a delivery robot, essentially, is a mobile robot that can do um, trajectory planning. It can do navigation. It can do obstacle avoidance. It can also do locomotion. It can also interact with its own sensors. It also has a physical design. So you see, um, when you design the robot from scratch on your own without the use of ROS, 
you will have to program all of these from the very beginning. So you have to do mechanical design, sensors and actuators, motion, locomotion, then these advanced concepts, and then finally you can develop the task of delivery. Uh, enter the location, go to the location, and so on and so forth. Or you have to build it in conjunction with all of the above. In ROS, however, all of this gray area here is already provided to you. All you have to do is take the available tasks or you know, functions, pick really uh, pick the task that you want and enable them on your robot and then use them as building blocks like Legos really to generate your high end. High is higher than all of those here. Yeah? Higher end program here, which is an advanced one. Let's say I don't want a delivery uh, robot. I want a search and rescue robot. So the search and rescue program is the high end program which is built on the features that the robot can do. It can do navigation and mapping, it can do interfacing, it can do locomotion, it can do sensors and actuators. So based on all of the above, it can do search and rescue. So the search and rescue is built upon everything else below it. This philosophy of building on lower end program is what the robot, uh, is what ROS is all about. And the way that it works is by using the cloud network directly. A lot of the, those uh, lower end programs that we talked about here are all available in the cloud. We just need the information from you. So the sensor data can go to the cloud. Maybe those arrows should be double sided, uh, you know, dual directions. So the sensors will go, information will go to the cloud using the applications or the, the algorithms here, and then will provide the decisions like go forward, go left, go right, and so on and so forth. So the robot operating network or the robot operating system of ROS basically it, it spreads or spreads this program upon multiple devices where it is needed, and it manages the the, the interaction between them accordingly. Um, again, we talked about this earlier. These are advanced or earlier. Uh, uh, this is basically the high end program. It requires the availability of the of the AMCL program which itself requires the path planner library, which itself requires the move based library, and so on and so forth. So in order for you to have your goal program, you have to have this dependency available or built in. Now, when you come to ROS and work, you will only be required to work here. And then all of this will be available or readily available or available for you to call. Or you don't really have to call all of this. You just have to work with AMCL. The rest will be automatically done. By working with AMCL, just provide the information that it needs from your program. And then whatever it needs from the others, it will manage on its own. So that's the beauty of ROS. And let's say your program was completed and someone else wants to customize your own program. They don't, have to, you know, they don't have to disturb your own program. They just create another version here and then based or build on it. And this is how the ROS development really works. And that's how, as a result, uh, this slide is quite uh, old. It's 2007, and this is what it started. Today is not really today. This is an old, relatively an old slide. I think this is uh, 2017 or 2018. This could, this number could be a lot more considerable today. We're talking about 2021, uh, 2021, not 2020. Uh, okay, so this is ROS, which is for any kind of robot. This is now the industrial ROS. And the industrial ROS focus entirely on industrial robots. Um, the majority of robots that you see in ROS or in ROS libraries are all about mobile robots. But for industrial ROS or iROS, it's mostly for manipulators, as you can see from, the, from, the, from its logo. So that's why industrial robots are the primary focus of iROS. So I suggest strongly that in order, if you want to work with advanced libraries and robotics, then at least take a look at IROS and see if you can learn and uh, get involved with it. Uh, if you want to learn more about ROS, you can go to the links shown here. This is the website to ROS. This is the installation. And these are tutorials and learning. Uh, one um, hiccup about ROS is that uh, although it's available on Windows, it's limited on Windows. It's primarily for Linux and uh, less on Mac. So the primary win uh, operating system for, for ROS is Linux, but less to on Windows or available, but you have to do a little bit of work on Windows and Mac as well. Uh, other online resources is OpenCV, um, and OpenCV has nothing to do with you, with your with the curriculum in VT, right? 
It's essentially it's an online library for programming functions that require um, computer vision processing or image processing. If you have a, a program for your robot that that involves a camera and you want to process the image, you can check out this online library that can help you with image processing uh, programs. Face++ is about face recognition. Uh, uh, this is a Chinese technology. Uh, it's developed in China. Um, they are actually using it for face recognition uh, world in there in China. But then again, it's, technology it's, itself is available, and uh, it's available in English and in Chinese. So it's called Face++. Uh, Freeboard.io is an is an example of an IoT client, uh, which we might work with at some point. Um, maybe not, but uh, essentially it's a client that you can use to work with IoT to show and, and develop your IoT uh, devices. Blink is another example, it's another IoT client, uh, just a different example. And I think this is it for this session. So you see, uh, this is, uh, let's just recap what we talked about in all of these slides. Uh, we covered uh, the components of industrial robots very briefly. In our third session, we will talk in, in greater details about the components. We talked about some terminologies that we will use throughout the semester. Uh, we also talked about application of industrial robots and some different ways of working with industrial robots. And we also introduced some online resources for you to work uh, for algorithms and just a sample of those online resources. Okay, well, thank you very much for this. And I'll see you in the next session. In the next session, we will talk in greater details about components of industrial robots. Um, and we'll also talk about different types of manipulators, different types of end defectors. So I'll see you in the next session. Take care.